Hi everyone, today I'll be presenting our work on using hardware ray transforms to accelerate ray primitive intersections for long thin primitive types. So as many of us know, bounding volume hierarchies play an important role in the performance of a modern ray tracer, and depending on the design decisions that you choose, that can have a really significant impact on traversal performance. In general, there's a trade-off when it comes to BVH design, where simple shapes lead to an efficient memory footprint, whereas more complex shapes can more tightly fit the underlying primitives and can achieve better culling. And so, over the years, we've largely been able to strike a balance between these two things. And so today, on modern GPUs, traversal of these BVHs is hardware accelerated. And so you might be tempted to say that BVH design is a solved problem. However, there's still room for improvement, and with that comes the possibility of better performance. So most modern bounding volume hierarchies usually use an axis-aligned bounding box to approximate the underlying primitives. These axis-aligned bounding boxes are relatively easy to compute. Um, you can just take the minimum in X, Y, and Z of your primitive, the maximum in X, Y, and Z, and those minimum and maximum corners then kind of implicitly represent an axis-aligned bounding box. As a result, these boxes are relatively few bytes to store, since you only need those two opposing corners. And then hierarchies of these axis-aligned bounding boxes are also relatively easy to compute and store. Both bottom-up and top-down builders can compute parent bounds by computing the minimum and maximum of the corners of the child boxes. Since parents in this hierarchy are also axis-aligned, you can uh, kind of leverage that to further reduce the storage size. And so these axis aligned boxes work relatively well when the bounding primitives are roughly uniform in scale, which you tend to see a lot with triangular meshes with nice topology. However, axis aligned boxes tend to struggle when dealing with long, thin, diagonally oriented primitives. The reason that these axis aligned boxes struggle with these primitive types has to do with culling. Ultimately, we want the bounding boxes here to more tightly fit the primitives because the more tightly they fit, the more rays that we can cull, and the fewer expensive intersection tests we have to do. However, when we build axis line bounding boxes over long, thin diagonal primitives, these bounds can be really large compared to the underlying curve, or a diagonal primitive. So just to illustrate this a bit, imagine a uniformly scaled triangle, a very long diagonal triangle, and a wavefront of rays. In this setup, both axis aligned boxes take up the same space, and so all these rays will hit both primitives axis aligned bounding boxes. However, while most of these rays will hit the uniformly scaled triangle on the left, very few will actually hit the triangle on the right. So since the axis aligned box containing that diagonal triangle isn't very tight, we kind of fail to cull many of these rays, and we have to do all these expensive intersection tests, which is bad for performance. And then to make matters worse, this, brought, this becomes even more problematic when we place multiple of these primitives together. So ultimately, we need to find a solution to this problem, since these long diagonal primitive types are actually really common. We see them all the time in the form of cylinders, curves, and ribbons. In production rendering, these primitives are commonly used to render hair and fur. So for example, this character, Autumn, is from the Blender movie Spring and uses about 3.4 million curve segments. Many of these curve segments are highly diagonal and lay uh, really close to each other. And then in scientific visualization, these primitives are commonly used to visualize tractography, streamlines, and glyphs. So in this picture, these primitives are being used to visualize the axons of a set of neurons from the neuromorpho dataset. Since we have ray tracing, we can kind of leverage effects like depth of field to greatly improve the perception of these overlapping neurons. But then again, many of these neurons are long, thin, and diagonal. So there are a couple different ways that we can go about tackling this problem. And one common solution is to use a more general BVH containing oriented bounding boxes. By orienting the bounding boxes to better align with the underlying primitives, these bounds can more effectively call out costly intersection tests for diagonal primitives. Unfortunately, these oriented bounding boxes can introduce overhead during traversal, and they can really significantly increase the complexity of building a BVH. For example, the work by Vope et al. requires a non-trivial, top-down, object-oriented bounding box builder, and their final speedup is limited due to the expensive oriented bounding box tests themselves. So consequently, these oriented bounding box hierarchies aren't very, um, they're not supported by many of today's ray tracing frameworks, and they're not really supported in modern hardware accelerated, uh, hardware accelerated frameworks. So now, interestingly enough, in addition to supporting BVH traversal in hardware, 
The Turing architecture also supports one level of hardware accelerated instancing. And so the basic idea there is you create a bottom level acceleration structure over your mesh that you'd like to instance. And then from there, that same mesh can be instanced several times inside of a top level acceleration structure. Each instance is placed into this top level using a three by four transformation matrix. And then the hardware handles the details of that transform for you during traversal. So at this point, we can kind of make five key observations. So the first observation is that this problem with thin diagonal geometry stems primarily from the large surface area of the enclosing axis aligned bounding boxes. Second, this issue is even more problematic in the context of hardware accelerated ray tracing. Since many of these thin primitive types must be intersected in software, the RT core must do an expensive context switch each time that the bounds of a primitive is hit. And since we're using these axis aligned boxes with poor coaling performance, we'll be doing these context switches all the time. The third observation is that more tightly fitting bounding objects would significantly reduce such failed tests. However, our fourth observation is while this is true, in practice this additional culling only really matters if it can also be done in a hardware accelerated way. We don't want to be doing a custom culling test in software since switching from the RT core to software is exactly what we're kind of trying to avoid in the first place here. And then Finally, arguably the most important observation relevant to our work is that the ray tracing hardware units on Turing can already do most of what a, a hardware ob object-oriented bounding box test would require. Each time a ray traverses an instance, it's transformed using that instance's affine transform, and then it traverses that child BVH only if the transformed ray hits that child BVH's root node. And so we can kind of reduce this problem of a hardware-oriented uh, a hardware accelerated oriented bounty box test to a combination of an instance transform and a suitably designed intersection program. So now before looking into arbitrary primitives, uh, let's for now just consider a simplified proof of concept. For now, let's consider the case where all primitives in our scene are regular cylinders with a fixed radius and without spherical end caps. So in this case, each cylinder can be represented in one of two ways. First, we can represent these cylinders through their intrinsic parameters, like their center, their orientation, their length, and their radius. Or alternatively, we can represent each cylinder through an affine transformation of a common unit cylinder. Now, this approach won't work in the general case. For example, we can't represent curves this way. But for now, let's just keep things simple. So just like how we can represent these cylinders in one of two ways, we can likewise insert these cylinders into a hardware acceleration structure in one of two ways. So one option would be to insert each intrinsic cylinder into a bottom level acceleration structure, computing axis aligned bounding boxes for each cylindrical segment, or alternatively, we can kind of break the rules a bit. And another option would be to insert several instances of a common unit cylinder into a top level acceleration structure. Now, although these two cases seem quite similar at first, there's actually a key difference in the way that these two cases perform in a hardware ray tracing framework. With both methods, rays hit the bounds of the top level acceleration structure. With the reference method, rays will primarily be traversing through the bottom level. However, with our instance approach, we'll instead mostly be traversing through the top. Now for the traditional solution, each time that a that we hit a leaf in the bottom level acceleration structure, we need to do an expensive context switch. However, with the instance approach, even if a ray does hit one of the large axis line bounding boxes in that top level, traversal is going to remain in hardware. The ray then first undergoes an instance transform, then starts traversal of single primitive blast testing for intersection against the root node. This traversal only switches to software intersection if the ray actually intersects this blast's root node, uh, this root bounding box, and, and stays in hardware otherwise. So since that root bounding box of that bottom level is specified in local space, it effectively acts as a hardware accelerated oriented bounding box test in world space. So now, with this approach, it's important to realize that this instance-based variant would actually in some sense be doing more work than the traditional method. However, we now have this advantage that everything involved in this oriented bounding box traversal process is handled, it's, it's handled in hardware, so that effectively reduces a lot of the overhead in this process. So to kind of quantify the potential speedups of this method, we created several artificial scenes containing bundles of n parallel cylinders. For each bundle, we tilt the bundle by 15 degrees until we're at a 45 degree angle. And as expected, we observed that the thinner and more diagonal the primitives, the higher the speedup with speedups reaching up to 3.8 times. And then just to kind of improve our intuition a little bit about where cost is going, here's a heat map demonstrating the clocks used per ray, where regions in red are more expensive. 
So on the left, you can almost see the axis aligned boxes of the cylinders in that heat map. And you can see that we're really suffering anywhere that array misses all of the primitives. On the right, these OBBs are successfully culling out most all of the context switches that we would be doing. So now, although we have this proof of concept that seems to be giving us really encouraging results, our technique so far has one big limitation. Right now we're making this assumption that the base primitive type that we're using can always be represented with several affine copies of a common base primitive. However, this really only works for cylinders and it doesn't work for other primitive types like curves since each curve is likely to be unique. So to really make this method useful in practice, we need to extend our previous approach to handle arbitrary primitives like rounded cylinders, curves, and so on. And so again, we can make several observations here. First, it's worth noting that our performance improvements don't actually come from the instancing itself. We don't actually benefit that much from reusing the same affine copy for each cylinder, but rather our proof of concept benefits most from the additional oriented bounding box test calling step that's done in hardware. The second observation that we can make here is that since we're looking to support custom primitive types, we'll be implementing our intersection tests in software. And since the intersection test is in software, whenever array hits a bounding box containing our instance root node, we can kind of do whatever we want at that point. So in particular, we can interpret the instance ID as if it were the primitive ID, and we can do a world space intersection test instead of a normal object space intersection test that a traditional instancing approach would do. So now to extend our proof of concept to support arbitrary primitive types, we'll now, uh, we'll now start with a data set consisting of n unique curve segments. As a first step, we'll compute the object-oriented bounding box over these curve segments. We'll then recreate these oriented bounding boxes as instances of a common empty masquerade object. This object is only being used for its root node, and it doesn't actually contain any common primitive data. Next, we'll build a top-level acceleration structure over those masquerading instances. And when we traverse rays against the setup, those rays are first going to hit the top-level root node, and then those rays will traverse through that top level, hitting the axis line boxes containing our OBBs. After that, these rays will undergo an instance transform in hardware. And in this case, for now, we're just going to be looking at this red-oriented bounty box. At this point, Instead of doing a context switch back to an expensive intersection test, these rays are further culled by that masquerading instance's root node, effectively implementing the oriented bounding box test. Then finally, since the underlying primitives are not affine copies of some common underlying primitive, we can instead interpret the instance ID as if it were a primitive ID, and then we can do a world space intersection test instead of a local space test. So overall, this process isn't all that different from our proof of concept. The important takeaway here is that we don't really care about what that instance contains, we're just using that instance for its OBB. And so to support arbitrary primitives, we interpret the instance ID as if it were a primitive ID, and then we do an intersection test in world space. So now let's move on to some, uh, some evaluation. So first we decided to test our technique against both the collection of scientific visualization data sets, as well as a set of production hair data sets. And then we also decided to test our approach on a couple different intersector types. So for the Saiva's data set, we use both Quilla's capsule as well as Han's sphere truncated cones, since both those intersectors are linear and they're going to give us an accurate visualization of the underlying data. For the production hair data sets, we additionally test against Reshitov's phantom curve intersector. As far as hardware goes, we tested on a pair of Quadro RTX 8000s, and for our software stack, we're using a mix of Optic 7.0 and Ubuntu 18.04. So for the Cyvis datasets from left to right, we have an IEEE visualization dataset from 2011, a DTI tractography dataset, and a collection of neurons from the Neuromorpho database. For these datasets, we kind of see mixed results. Though our method is never much worse, it doesn't actually achieve significant performance improvements either. We see about a 25% performance improvement for the contest data set on the left, but then the other two don't really improve that much. We have an explanation for why this is, and I'll get to that in a moment. For our production uh, data sets, from left to right, we have this single curl data set from a PBRT scene and a curly hair data set from Jem Yuxel's group. And then we have this auto model from the Blender Movie Spring, as well as Frank from the Blender Movie Cosmos Laundromat. 
So for all our hair data sets, and unlike our Saiva's data sets, we consistently outperform the reference method anywhere from 1.59 times to 5.92 times. So in this table, um, different intersector types are shown from the top to bottom, and arguably the intersector that's most relevant to these data sets is the phantom curve intersector on the very bottom. A bit of background on that phantom intersector, it's recommended that you subdivide curves at inflection points to improve the numerical precision and the performance of, those, of that intersector. And an interesting observation when combined with our technique is that when we use that phantom intersector, our improvement over the reference increases with the number of pre-subdivisions, in particular for very curly uh, models like Frank. This kind of indicates that the subdivision leads to a more cylindrical-like segment that can be more tightly enclosed by an OBB than a highly curved segment would be. Then interestingly, our speedups also correlate primarily with surface area reduction. And this correlation is interesting because it means that we might be able to rely on this uh, surface area comparison while building an acceleration structure before rendering. So for example, with the phantom intersector, our surface area reduction gets better and better as we subdivide the curves more and more since those OBBs can more tightly fit the more cylindrical-like data. And then we are also able to see a lack of performance improvement for Frank in the phantom intersector no subdivision case. As for our SIVIS models, we can kind of attribute the lack in significant performance improvements to a lack of surface area reduction. As the surface area predicts, the SIVIS 2011 dataset sees the largest performance improvements, since it also sees the largest surface area reduction. And interestingly, although we do see reduction in surface area for the other two SIVIS models, it appears that the performance overhead reduces that potential speed up there. So now, although these speedups that we've achieved by our method are actually a lot higher than we initially anticipated, they do come at the price of higher memory consumption. For the reference access line bounding box method, each primitive costs only a few bytes for that primitive's corresponding bottom level memory. Well, in our method, we need to store an entire instance per primitive, each of which contains a 3x4 transformation matrix. And as can be seen in this table, our current method's memory overhead is quite high at roughly an additional 300% or roughly a 4x over the reference method's memory footprint. So now it's possible that this per instance memory cost will be reduced with subsequent driver changes to the GPU, but those changes are kind of outside of the control of a user. So now to conclude, we have presented a method that leverages existing ray tracing hardware units to realize what's essentially a hardware accelerated object bounding box culling test. Our approach works by treating the root bounds of a bottom level acceleration structure as if it were an OBB, which we place into a top level acceleration structure through instancing. However, our method is different from traditional instancing in that while instancing traditionally is limited to creating multiple affine copies of the same primitive, our approach is not. Instead, our method reuses the original world space intersection code, which enables us to handle unique primitives like curves, capsules, and cones. Despite these speedups, our current method comes with several major limitations. First, our method comes with this massive memory overhead of up to 4x compared to the reference version. And then uh, for some of our data sets, you know, that speedup might be worth the memory trade-off, but for many others, that could be way too pro uh, prohibitive. And then in addition to memory overhead, the maximum reasonable model size is also kind of limited by how many instances Optics allows in its instance acceleration structure. So as of this work, the limit was 16 million instances, and although the limit uh, has been kind of relaxed since um, Optics 7.1 came out, this still kind of poses a hard limit on what our method can do. And then since we're already using Optics' instancing capability to create our OBBs, we also currently can't create real instances of the geometries that use this technique. For example, we can't really create several instances of Autumn with our approach without losing our hardware accelerated OBB test. Now, as for future work, we believe it'd be interesting to look at combining our method with the work by Vope et al.'s object-oriented box BVH builder. In particular, it'd be interesting to build a hybrid system where Vope et al.'s similarity metric could be used to find similarly oriented subtrees, while our method could then provide a hardware accelerated way of traversing this. From there, there are multiple primitives um, or from there, multiple primitives could share that uh, same oriented bounding box, which would in theory reduce the, over the overall memory overhead. So ultimately, we're pretty optimistic about our approach. Even beyond our specific masquerading technique, perhaps the core insight of this work is in how useful hardware ray transforms can be in rotating geometry to minimize BVH node surface area. Thank you for listening, and feel free to email me if you have any questions.